and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Well, here we are at episode 100. I never thought it would keep on going, but it seems love for the Spectrum is still strong. Now then, what can we do to celebrate? Since I started this whole show, so many things have changed. I've bought so many exciting Spectrum-related things, filling shelf after shelf, and being happy to share it with you guys. I certainly don't want to hide it away. I've moved house twice, having to put all my specky stuff in boxes twice and unpack it twice, hoping that it didn't get damaged or lost. I started producing the show's magazine, free to download. We've gone through, almost, the Covid pandemic along with the rest of the world. And oh yes, I nearly got married. Again, delayed due to Covid, but now rescheduled. So what about this episode? What should I do about it? I put this question to Twitter and Patreon followers, and there were some interesting suggestions. And it got me to thinking of things that I always wanted to do on the show, but never got around to. And the list is quite long, to be honest. I always wanted to redo episode one, because it was short, and it was also a test episode, not really slick and put together well. And at the same time, I could also update the Space Invader shootout. But Tang was against me on that one. A vicious race of aliens called the Squarm have enslaved mankind, and only a few survivors can be found. Together they... I always wanted to get my Spectrum online using the VTX 5000 modem that I bought several years ago, but for that I'd need a view data bulletin board that was still accessible via phone lines, or indeed set one up myself on an old laptop somewhere. Again, that's a lot of work. And then I happened upon a fully active BBS. Yes, there's still a view data bulletin board system running. So. Let's get on then, but before we start, let's go back to the beginning. The VTX 5000 modem first started to appear in magazines at the back end of 1983, being sold by, seemingly, Micronet 800 and Prism jointly for £74.95. The unit itself was designed and manufactured by OE Limited. Early the following year, it won Peripheral of the Year at the British Microcomputing Awards. Modem House later took over the device and dropped the price to £49.95, with users of Sinclair User Magazine getting a special deal. All looked to be going well until two things happened. Firstly, the Spectrum 128 was launched and the device didn't work 100% on some models and not at all on others. Then, Modem House ran into difficulties. In 1987, an upgraded ROM was released that extended the device's functions, but by this time it was too late. By 1989, you could get the modem free of charge with a subscription to Micronet 800. There was at the time very little awareness of Micronet and what it did, apart from the adverts and a few mentions of Shades the Online Adventure, and occasionally the other online game, Mud. A book by Melbourne House, published in 1984, called The Micronet Book, formed a brilliant introduction to communications, Micronet 800, and of course the VTX 5000. It really is an excellent read too, covering many aspects from the very basic idea of transferring data across telephone lines, to machine code programs to control the modem itself. It had photographs and diagrams, and for anyone interested in this side of computing, it would have been an essential read. My book seems to have been supplied by Modem House, as this card was inside. On to the modem itself then. This wonderful device was the very first step for many users into the world of communications. It was, as far as I know, the only Spectrum-specific modem on the market, and was produced for Prism and BT to get Spectrum users onto Prestel and Micronet 800. You could get other non-Spectrum specific modems, as we all know, but you needed a serial port and dedicated software to run them. The VTX 5000 was designed to be just plugged in and it did everything for you. The unit came in a colourful box, featuring the artwork of the advert claiming the most spectacular add-on under the Spectrum. On the back is a very Sinclair-like illustration explaining how it all connects up. Inside we get a small blue manual, with details about Micronet 800 and nothing else. Remember, this modem was specifically for Micronet 800, and no other services. It explains how to use the device, and goes on to show other aspects, such as telesoftware. The unit itself is about the same size as the original Spectrum models, and looks simple yet functional. This was really an exciting time for me, getting this device ready to go online. It was just like being back in 1984. It comes with a triple port extender and a male-to-male -male adapter for through connectivity. 
to connect it up, you plug in the triple extender into your Speccy, attach it to the VTX5000, and using the male to male adapter, you get a through port. You plug the BT lead into the wall socket, and you plug the phone into the back of the VTX5000. And you do need a phone, otherwise you won't be able to connect to anything. When you turn it on, we get a nice Micronet intro logo. And a key press later, we get the menu. Now this should be all very nostalgic for some of you. The menu allows you to log on, save frames, that's each individual page of teletext, download telesoftware or exit to basic. If you try to connect, you're asked for your ID, and my original ID didn't work, but you can bypass this by using 10 asterisks. However, you are now asked to dial Micronet, and this is obviously impossible because it doesn't exist anymore. At this point, I thought it was the end, and that I'd have to pack everything up and not come back to it. But as mentioned before, I discovered a view data bulletin board system still online called Telstar. You can't connect to this using the firmware built into the VTX, but you can use other software. There are a few tools available, and I used a PD program called FireView. This lets you dial any number and connect. To connect, you have to manually dial using the phone, and when you hear the modem answer, that's the high-pitched whistling you can hear, remember that, you switch the VTX online and hang up, and a key press later, and you should be into the system. This was fantastic, using a real spectrum and real hardware to get online in 2020. Telstar has lots of features, news, weather, business, and a section that when complete will hold historic pages from Micronet 800. There are gateways to other systems, and one even going to Colossal Cave, but sadly I couldn't get that to work. Now at this point I was almost hypnotised. My little Specky was talking to the world, page after glorious page, oh yes. Pour me a beer, I'll be here for a while. The speed of the page draw is how it was back in the day. This is a 1275 baud modem, which means the data rates are very slow. Very, very nostalgic though, I love this. Telstar had some pages that were empty, as it was being worked on, but just look, look at this, view data. Later, software was written by the community that allowed the VTX to connect to non-view data bulletin boards, known as scrolling bulletin boards. I searched and found a few of these, and at the same time I found two active systems in the UK. Sadly, one didn't answer, so I assumed it had been closed down. The other, though, answered and was still alive. The first thing I tried was a program called Dr. Scroll. Setting it up, I dialed the number, and nothing happened. Hmm. Bit of a problem, I thought. I then found another program called New Term, which also failed to do anything. And finally, I tried a new find, VTX Edit, and this had a specific menu option for scrolling bulletin boards. I tried this, and again, nothing. At this point, I assumed that I didn't have the upgraded ROM in the modem that would handle it. Depending on which scrolling software you use, you'll get two results. One looks like the modem is trying to negotiate speeds, and it does this by starting at the highest rate and moving down through them until it gets the one that suits the calling modem. If it can't find the right speed, it will disconnect, and this happens several times. Then the other route will just fill the screen full of characters. Although within VTX Edit, there's a really nice piece of nostalgia for me, as it shows an advert for one of my favourite systems back in the day, Phantom BBS. I used to log in here all the time, and it even had one of my games to download, and I also ran the play-by-mail game called Junk. Sadly though, after a week of trying different methods, I was unable to connect to a scrolling bulletin board, and that was definitely because I didn't have an updated ROM as previously mentioned. I tried three or four different communication tools, including Voice Scroll, VX Term, two different versions of Doctor Scroll, and others, and the nearest I got was a screen full of characters, and that was a real shame. Overall though, the VTX5000 was superb. This little unit got Spectrum users online. Micronet 800 itself had chat lines, interviews, special user groups, as in hobbies or computing and not the ones you may be thinking of, email, news, telesoftware and online games. All the things you associate with the internet today, but this was in 1984, and accessible with a Spectrum and a VTX5000 modem. I love this little box of tricks. It's just a pity there's only one system you can connect to. I spent a lot of time just reading the pages. Now this is nostalgia. 
I really did have to drag myself away from the screen to get on with the rest of this episode, though. Where are we up to then? Ah yes, things I always wanted to do for the show. I always wanted to do a mammoth emulator shootout and compare emulators across all platforms. But that's a lot of work again, and they do keep being updated. I suppose I could look at old emulators, but I sort of did that in a few episodes about old laptops. Another thing I always wanted to do was a mammoth Pac-Man arcade clone shootout. But again, that would be a huge undertaking. But I did it anyway. Strap yourselves in, or if you're not interested in this section, skip ahead 26 minutes. Yes, I've been threatening to do this one for years, but kept putting it off due to the masses of versions there was for the Spectrum. I'll try to keep this as short as possible. We all know Pac-Man by now. Released into the arcades by Namco in 1980, you control Pac-Man as he eats dots for points, avoids ghosts, gets bonuses, eats power pills, etc, etc. For this shootout we're going to exclude typings, otherwise we'll be here all day. So, how did the Spectrum versions compare then? This is Android, by ERE. The game plays well, but it's a little bit too easy due to the number of power pills around. The movement is in character squares, and the maze differs slightly from the arcade. Because of this, it can sometimes be hard to place your Pac-Man at junctions. The movement is also quite fast, making this even more tricky. A decent start then, and I'm sure things are going to go downhill soon. Next is Berksman, written by Paul Fisher and released in 2012. This is a newer game, written using Burrell's ZX Basic compiler. It's rather a nice version. It doesn't have the tune, but gameplay is spot on. The ghosts do different things and don't just home in on your position. And this is a very competent version, really. I never saw any bonuses, though, and even though the graphics move in character squares, I enjoyed playing this. Next is Blobo, from Continental Software, released in 1983. Now this is an odd version, but the game is not really a clone. The graphics are large, but not identifiable as Pac-Man. There are bonuses, but when you eat a power pill that looks like barbed wire, you just change into a monster for some reason. If you die, the maze changes to a different layout, and this can often mean instant death. This is more of a game inspired by Pac-Man, rather than a straight clone. Next is Classic Muncherb from Bubble Bus Software, released in 1987. A nice tune to start with, and the game has huge graphics. Although that makes it look nice, it does make it tricky to control sometimes. Things move really well, and there are bonuses and power pills, and it's all there, but the size of the main character and layout of the maze makes navigation difficult. I found myself all too often unable to turn at a junction, and getting caught by the chasing ghosts. A competent game then, but I suspect it could become frustrating when you keep dying due to the layout and size of the graphics. Next we have Dotty from Dollarsoft, released in 1984. Another game that is not so much a clone, but inspired by. The colourful 3D maze doesn't really add anything to the game, other than a non-standard maze layout, but at least the graphics move smoothly, and there are some nice sound effects in there. Control is good, and this sort of reminds me of a game that we'll see soon called Haunted Hedges. 
There are different mazes, but I'm not inspired to go back to this. Next is Ghost Gobbler by Arwin Software, released in 1984. Oh dear. This is basic. Things move slowly. Key response is terrible. Sound is terrible. Let's leave this one alone, shall we? Moving on to Ghost Hunt from PSS, released in 1983. An interesting screen layout, but the gameplay is fine. The character base movement doesn't detract too much and sound is well used. A decent game, but the maze is a bit odd looking and makes the game look worse than it actually is. Next is Ghost Revenge from Micromania, released in 1983. Another game with large graphics that move relatively smoothly. The maze looks okay, and there is a nice tune before each game that almost sounds like the Pac-Man music. Gameplay is fine, but it's very hard to catch a ghost once you've eaten a power pill. Not a bad version really, good to play and a nice challenge. Next is Nasha from r, r Software, released in 1983. Another game with a huge maze and not many dots to eat. The large graphics move in character squares though, but do look good, and the gameplay is fine as well. Sound is good with some nice effects, and it's certainly a playable version. There are fruit bonuses and side passages, so this scores well on most points. Next is Gobbler Ghost from CDS, released in 1982. Here we have a maze that looks like the arcade version, but things go downhill as soon as you start to play. The graphics are small and moving character squares. The ghosts have no intelligence and just home in on your position and you can end up with a line of ghosts just following you about the maze. Sound is a bit dull and gameplay lacks any excitement really. You know the ghosts are just going to head straight for you, so there's no surprises. And even when you eat a power pill, they still keep chasing you. Next is Gobbleman from Arctic Computing, released in 1983. Here we get a decent sized maze, but the layout makes it hard to navigate sometimes. The graphics are small and moving character jumps, but the sound is slightly above average. Eating power pills seems to send the ghosts into a fit of random movement, but at least they don't just keep following you. When you die, there's no animation, sadly, just random characters displayed on screen. And you can get instant death syndrome when you restart a game after being caught. I bought this when it was released and was unimpressed, and it's still a below average game today. Next is Gobbler from Saturnsoft, released in 1982. Oh dear, where do you start? The colour scheme is terrible, control, terrible, sound, terrible, and yes, this is a basic game. One to stay clear of then. Next is Gulpman from Campbell Systems, also released by Micromega in 1982. This is not really a clone again as there are many elements that differ. 
First you have a laser that sends the chasing monsters back to their start location, and secondly you have a choice of mazes and speeds to play. The game is partly basic, and the graphics are small and moving character jumps. It's not a bad game in itself, just not a Pac-Man clone. This is Haunted Hedges, released by Micromega in 1983. Another game that's not really a clone, but more inspired by the original. All of the elements are here though, with bonus items and power pills, although in this game, they're pickaxes. The graphics are larger than the usual early games, but still moving character squares. Sound is okay with a few machine code effects, and gameplay is good, offering a choice of enemy intelligence before you start. Not a bad game, but not a contender for a clone. And now we're on to Hungry Horace from Scion, released in 1982. I'm not really sure why this is here, but probably the first Pac-Man-like game that many people would have played back then. doesn't look like the arcade, but at least the gameplay is acceptable and certainly challenging. The graphics are large and move smoothly, but the sound is just so annoying. The areas to move between different parts of the maze are not immediately obvious, but you soon get to learn them. There are bonus items and power pills in the form of a bell, but this isn't really a clone. On to Maze Chase from Houston Consultants in 1983, and back to the clones then, and this early attempt certainly shows its age. Small graphics moving in character squares and simple sound effects. When you lose a life, all the dots you've previously eaten are put back, which is very annoying. Control is fine and gameplay is passable, I suppose, but this one will be at the bottom of the list of clones to try out. Next we have Miracle Man from Matt Barber in 2008, and this is a tiny game, running in at just 4K. However, it needs a 1 to 8K machine to run. A large maze holds large smooth graphics and offers crisp control. Gameplay is good but can sometimes trip you up and result in the level being impossible to complete due to the movement of the ghosts. There is a tune playing throughout and I couldn't find a way to turn it off and get just sound effects, if indeed there are any. A good game, nice to play and worth trying if you like Pac-Man. to Monster Muncher, released by Spectrum Games in 1983. A green maze with large graphics, and although they move in character squares, because of the size, it isn't all that obvious. Sound is basic with just a few beeps, and the beeps keep playing when there's no dots to eat. Bonuses do pop up from time to time, and the difficulty is about right. Green flashes when you eat a power pill or get killed, and I can't see a reason for this. The maze layout sometimes makes it tricky to manoeuvre as well, but an average game overall. This is Muncher, released by Silversoft in 1982. An early game here, but at least the maze looks familiar even if it is green. The Pac-Man has been changed into a disembodied head, and moves around the maze smoothly. The layout makes collecting dots and manoeuvring tricky though, especially when being chased by ghosts. Power pills do the usual thing, but I never saw any bonus items. Sound is good with some nice effects, and overall this is a competent version.
Unter Munchman from Astro, released in 1983. A blue maze at last, but the gameplay here is poor. Things move in jumps and the key response is bad, causing you to get stuck in the badly laid out maze. The ghosts just home in on your position too, which is pretty poor, and this makes the game tricky, especially due to the speed that the thing runs. I never saw any bonus items too, but then again my games never lasted long enough anyway. A poor version. Now on to Munchman from Contrast Software, released in 1983. Oh dear. This game is very bad to play, and feels like compiled basic. The ghosts sometimes don't move for ages, and I suspect this is key repeat kicking in when you hold down the movement key for a long time. And key response in general is terrible. Graphics are small and jerky, and there's nothing appealing about this game at all. Sound are basic beeps and a few simple tunes. The screenshot on World of Spectrum is not the same as the game file either. Anyway, not one I would suggest you play. Now on to Munchman from DKtronics, released in 1983. A green maze, but the game plays so much better than a lot of the other ones so far. The graphics are medium sized and moving character squares, but control is good and responsive. Sound is used well with some good effects. The gameplay though is spot on and I really enjoyed this after some poor offerings I've had to endure. Bonus items appear and the ghosts have their own movement patterns. A good version then and one worth playing. Is everyone still here? We'll continue then. This is OC Man, released by Oblo in 2011. This is a game written using Burial Compiled Basic, and it's pretty impressive for that. The game starts with a familiar tune, and the graphics are really smooth. Gameplay is a little slow though, but all the elements are there. The ghosts do their own thing instead of just homing in on you, and there are bonus items from time to time. Control is good and sound is effective, and overall a decent version, if a little slow. On to the first game called Pac-Man then, and this one is by Anko Software, released in 1983. Oh dear. This game was on a compilation, and it really didn't even deserve that. This is more like a typing than a commercial release, and yes, it's written in basic. You can see how bad it is, can't you? Let's move on. Next is Pac-Man from Atarisoft, released in 1984. This is the official release, although it has its own story that we'll come on to later. As you would expect, this has all the features, but the graphics do move in character squares. Sound is used very well with different eating sounds, a sound for the power pill and bonus collections. Gameplay is spot on too, and the layout, being the same as the arcade, is perfect and you never get stuck trying to manoeuvre around. Response is great, making for an excellent experience. I really enjoyed playing this, and it feels just right. Now we have the Pac-Man emulator, released by Simon Owen in 2011. 
Now this is not strictly a clone, but I thought I would add it here for comparison, and this is how Pac-Man should look, and play, and sound. Albeit with a bit of colour clash. This is an emulator that uses the arcade ROMs to play the real Pac-Man on your Spectrum plus 2 of plus 3. You have to provide your own ROMs of course, and create your own tap file, but the end result is real. The real Pac-Man on your Specky. Brilliant, but sadly not a clone. On to Pakakuda then from Rabbit Software, released in 1983. This is an interesting mix of arcade sounds and tunes with changed graphics. The graphics themselves are small and moving jumps, and the sound, apart from the start tune and death sound, are just standard beeps, and Pac-Man looks to have grown a tail. Control is okay, and the gameplay works, sort of, but you can get stuck on the maze due to the layout. You do get bonus items to collect, but this is a below average attempt. Onto Potty Planter from Mogul Communications, released in 1984. This is one of several games that turn the concept around, and have the main character dropping things rather than collecting or eating them. The maze is fine to navigate, and the graphics are okay, but move in character squares. Sound is used well, with beats for various things. There are a lot of bonus items to grab, and lots of power pills too, or whatever they're supposed to be. The ghosts or spiders still chase you though, even if you've eaten one. Gameplay is average, but there are much better games out there than this. Now on to Snackman from Amber Software, released in 1983. Okay, the maze works, and the graphics look fine, apart from they move in jumps. Sound is basic, and control is a bit hit and miss. The key responses can be slow, meaning you get stuck at junctions far too often. You do get bonus items, but gameplay suffers because of the layout and key response. Phew, not many left now. On to Specman, released by C-Tech in 1982. Okay, I'm not sure there's much to say here. A slow, badly written basic game released commercially. The graphics are poor, movement is poor, key response is terrible, and sound is awful. The ghosts just home in on your position and keep chasing you even if you eat a power pill. One to forget. I want a Spectres from Bugbite released in 1982. Here is a game that switches things around again, and you have to put things down instead of eating them. The graphics are large and move smoothly, but do flicker badly. Sound is great, with some nice effects. The main problem with the game is that when you eat a power pill, or in the case of this game, you touch a generator, all the dots you have laid down to that point will vanish once the generator finishes. And that's a real pain. So you have an additional strategy and things to think about. Do you use the generators first or try to avoid them altogether? Gameplay is good and with the added strategy it makes it a really interesting game. Sadly it's not a clone of Pac-Man, more inspired by it. On to Spooky Man from Abex, released in 1982. The downloadable version crashed for me every time I ate a power pill, so I had to use my own tape copy. The graphics are average, but moving character squares, sound is basic. 
with a few beeps here and there, and the control is a bit hit and miss. The layout means you often get stuck at junctions, and the ghosts change into strange shapes when you eat a power pill or seemingly for no reason at all. There are bonus items to collect, but the gameplay is well below average. And now onto Zedman by DJL Software, released in 1983, and it's a really great game too. Does this look familiar and sound familiar? Well, this game was released in 1983, and Atari came knocking at the author's door, claiming copyright infringement. The result was the game was repackaged with slightly different graphics and released as the official AtariSoft product. So this game has everything. The sound, the control, the layout and the gameplay. And it's a really great version that only lacks the official label. And now on to a few last minute contenders. First is Pack Hack, a hacked version of the Atari Soft's Pac-Man with slightly changed graphics and maze to adhere more to the arcade version. Alan Turvey did all the work here and the maze looks much better. The large graphics also look great. The gameplay and sound is the same as the official release and I think this hacked version is really very good. However, it isn't an official release, so does that make it count in this shootout? Next is Pac-Man The Curse of the Slimers from DEFB. This was released in 2020 and includes several mazes such as the Miss Pac-Man maze. Movement is silky smooth and control is excellent. Sound is a bit standard though with no tune or death sound and the ghosts change the colour of the dots as they move over them. Maybe this isn't 100% finished yet. A good game nonetheless though. Right, how do you judge all of that then? There were some really great games in there. Some with huge graphics and smooth graphics, some with accurate gameplay, and some that worked just really well. There were some real stinkers in there too. Terrible games, Terrible graphics, terrible control, terrible mazes, layouts, terrible colours, you name it, it's all in there. The most accurate, apart from the emulator of course, is the official release, which must also include Zedman. Alan's hack also improves on that as well. So, for that arcade feel on the spectrum, Pack Hack is my favourite unreleased version, with the official Pac-Man being the best one that got released. I think it's time to move away from Pac-Man now. Wow, is anyone still there? Well done. We're on the home straight now, though. We're quite a way in, and Jeff hasn't even said a word yet. Maybe he's fallen asleep. Jeff, are you there? So now it's my turn for something that I've always wanted to do, but never got round to, which is your Desert Island Discs, Paul. Oh, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to do it. Okay. And so. what I thought we'd do is, we do it in the style of Desert Island Disc, so it's almost like an interview, so I'm going to ask you some questions and then we'll uh, do the games in between. Right here. So the first question, and I'm sure people are interested in all this, when you started the Spectrum show, what, eight, nine years ago? Mm. Did you expect to get to episode 100? No. I didn't expect to get past episode one because it it was just a tester to, I don't know, practice some video editing skills because I was doing something at work and I put it on YouTube and it got quite a good response and then uh, shortly afterwards a friend gave me his Spectrum Plus and a wafer drive and about 10 games or something and I thought I'll, put, I'll do one about the wafer drive as the next episode and then it just took off from there. There was not, nowhere did I ever think I would get beyond 10 if that or, you know. But 100 is, yeah, quite a big landmark. So, your first game? My first game 
was released in 1982 by Melbourne House and it's The Hobbit. And the reason I chose this as one of my games is because it was a landmark game, it was revolutionary and I've never finished it. I've read lots of hints about it, I've not seen a walkthrough and I can get so far into it but I want to sit down and get all the way through it just for once without any hints or anything. Okay, back right, back to questions. So, looking back at those early Spectrum shows, they were about, what, 11 to 16 minutes each? They were quite short. <laughs> they were very and, short, yeah. And it's it's grown and grown and grown. I think I spotted an episode that was nearly an hour long. So does this cause you any problems, Paul? It causes me immense amount of problems. The, the original ones, because they were so mishap and sort of thrown together, were short, like you say, 15 minutes. And then I started moving up, and I wanted to make the shows as near as 30 minutes as possible. However, I have made a couple of ones that are longer than that. Now, making a two-hour special is impossible within a month for what I want to do. I mean, making making a 30-minute episode can take about three weeks, three and a half weeks, of in and out, of jumping in and out, filming, taking photographs, reviewing, playing games, as well as other real-life stuff. So going beyond 30 minutes, I would have to quit my job <laughs> probably <laughs> um, I don't have adverts on my videos so I don't make any money that way the only money I make is from Patreon and that's used to repair my spectrums uh, when they break uh, or fix things that I've bought that are broken so uh, I don't actually make money out of it so what's your second game my second game and I'm sure lots of people will know that this is going to be on there is Jetpack by Ultimate Play the Game there's a surprise. There's a surprise. And it's on there because A, it's my favourite game. B, I've only managed to complete it twice in my life. And both of those were in the last two or three years. And those were done at retro events. But it's a game that I know I can complete if I put enough time into it. And I think it's... Well, obviously, it's really good to complete a game after so long. And it's good to go back and keep completing it. So, yeah, it's my favourite game. I, I never get tired of it. I can always play a game of Jetpack. Next question. Did you expect the show to be as popular as it is? You've got nearly 8,000 subscribers and most of your videos get 5,000 views probably within the weekend you release it. One of the things that I'm really, really pleased about is the difference between subscribers and views and it's quite close sometimes. Um, I have seen channels that have got 20,000 subscribers and their video views are uh, 500 or 600, hmm. which is a bit of a disparity. I'm really pleased. Your, that your next show got more views than you have subscribers, by the way. <laughs> well, there you go. That's an amazing Episode thing to do. Yeah. I'd never thought there'd be that many people wanting to watch a video about the Spectrum. So, yeah, I'm aghast. Should we say that, that that many people wanted to watch and still want to watch a show about um, a Spectrum, a computer that was released in 1982. And your next game? Next game is... We're moving away from... Uh, adventures, we're moving away from action games and we're moving on to a game that can be played at a nice leisurely pace and that's Cyclone from Vortex Software. The helicopter rescue game with a sort of 3D view. Uh, this is a game that is one of those games if you've got an hour to spare you can sit down and play it. It's not a pick up and shoot and five minutes later you can go put it down again. It's one of those games you've got to work your way through, follow where the cyclone is and move away from it and rescue the people. So it's, it's not a quick game to play, but it's one of those games that is therapeutic to play, really. So out of your 100 shows, or 99 that you've made so far, is there a favourite thing that you have from the shows? Something that you really enjoyed doing? The chats. <laughs> right answer. I enjoy doing the chats because 
I don't have to write the script. I don't have to record and re-record and re-record and then find video footage. And Well, I do have to find bits of video footage, but I can not to take too much away from it. I can just throw anything, and I've got lots of stock footage of playing games and stuff, and I can throw things at it um, that I've already got. So there's no planning, there's no writing of the script, there's no working my way through it and, and slipping up and then having to re-record everything. It's sitting down, having a good chat with you. And I know it wasn't in there in the early days, but yeah, I, yeah, that's that's the bit I, I quite like. It's, it's quite relaxing. It's like being down the pub with the mate, isn't it? Yeah, pity we can't do it down the pub at the moment, but <laughs> yes. it, it certainly is. So your next game... My next game is an adventure game, and it's Adventure One by Abasoft. There are lots of reasons why I want this. I have completed it, but it took me 20-odd years to complete on different platforms and different versions. And its I think I've likened this to going home and putting on your favourite slippers. It's a game that I can easily get into, and all the places are familiar, but it's still challenging because I can only remember sort of half of it and then I have to start trying to figure out what the rest of it is. And, and as you complete a puzzle or as, you, as you're greeted with a puzzle, you get that sort of feeling that, oh, I remember, I've done this, and then you can carry on. So it's it's a sort of comforting game. Fair enough, well, that's good. You want, you want a comforting game if you're marooned on a desert island, don't you? <laughs> Amongst other things, yes. Now, similar to the last question... Is there something you've really disliked doing that's been such a faff on and so much trouble that you really didn't like it? Hmm, good question. Um, the thing that I started really enjoying, but by the end of it I nearly packed it all in and stopped doing them, was episode 40 for the magazines. That was a real nightmare to do. It was something that I wanted to do and something that I enjoyed doing until about, I don't know, a week before it was due to be rendered out. And then it just kept crashing and I kept finding more magazines that I'd missed off and I kept having to go back and rewrite the script and then re-record all the script and then re-edit it. It was, it, I was so close to just packing it all in and going onto a desert island somewhere, but there you go. <laughs> I do remember when you did that thinking you must have done a huge amount of research for that. <laughs> yes, I did. And I, I still missed three or four magazines out, believe it or not. What's your next game? Next game, and I think this is one that you're going to agree with, is Fred from Quicksilver. Oh, um, yes. Yes, it's it's a very jerky game when you play it. It can hurt your eyes at times, but it's one of those games. It's a bit of a therapeutic game. Again, you just plot your way to the top of the, te- uh, of the pyramid. Um, it's quite easy to play, but it's still challenging, and it's a game that I can sit down and play. A bit like Cyclone, you can sit down and play it for hours, and it gets therapeutic and almost hypnotic at times. So we've had some questions looking back at the episodes. Let's look forward. Will we see any Spectrum Next content in the next 100 shows? Uh, I have penciled in a segment in the next 10 episodes for Spectrum Next. What's going to be in them, I don't know. Whether it's going to be games reviews, whether it's going to be upcoming games, whether it's going to be... Um, hardware insights or whether it's going to be programming I don't know I I have penciled it in I haven't got anything definitely in there yet it all depends on what comes around in the next two or three months as we're recording this and your next game my next game is another game by Quicksilver and it's a game that I like purely because I can complete it and did do on a Patreon video not so long ago and it's Timegate you know I've never completed that it's, it's, really easy. it's really easy to complete, and the, there are different levels, so on the first level you've only got to get through four time zones to get back, and when I did it on Patreon, I quite luckily hit, I think it was two or three time gates straight back, back to back on top of each other, so you teleport to a random area on the map, and if there's a time gate there you go straight through to the next one, and I did that twice or three times straight after each other, so <laughs> I finished it in about two minutes when, when it should have taken longer, but yeah, I do like it because it's random, and because there's strategies, and it's, it's another sit down and play a game, and I can complete it. All good choices so far. Are there any guests you would like to have on the show i would like to have lots of guests on the show i would like to talk to guests about certain aspects i'd like to have don Priestley on i'd like to have sandy white on I'd, anybody that's old school i'd like to have too i'd like to get on i'd really like to get john hollis on who wrote timegate and games designer 
and find out about Timegate, where he got his inspiration, and and the games designer, what he was hoping to get out of a game games designer, and was it restricted by the spectrum, and you know, could it be, could it have been any better, that sort of thing. And Rod Cousins, um, the guy behind Quicksilver in general, liked to speak to him, particularly about the setting up of the early days, setting up the company, and the problems around the charity tapes that they released. Okay, that was guests. Your next game. My next game is Penetrator by Melbourne House. An excellent, probably the best scramble clone for the Spectrum, but the, that's not the reason why I chose, choose it. The reason why I choose it is because of the level designer. So you could create endless levels for yourself in any style. So you could create a Flappy Bird level, you could create a totally impossible level <laughs> and send yourself mad, or you could create an easy level and just win it every time. Um, Lots think, of long levity in Paint the Treasure, isn't there? There is. And I've never really understood why they didn't put out compilations of levels designed by um, different people. My maths is right. That should be seven games. So this is we're nearly at nearly, nearly at, at the, the end. end. Yeah. So regarding the spectrum show, is there anything that you're really looking forward to for the future? I have a long list of hardware that I want to review for the show. I could fill probably twenty episodes with hardware reviews, but I want to intersperse them with software stuff and company stuff and other things that's not hardware. So there's quite a lot of exciting hardware coming up. Um, which I'm not prepared to <laughs> give away at this point. And your final game? The final game is going to be a complete left field thing. It's Leaderboard, the golf game. Or any golf game, but Leaderboard, the one that I reviewed, had so many courses. And I hate golf in general. I don't like golf as a sport. I don't like watching it on TV. But playing it on computer, on a computer, is a totally different thing. I loved all the Link series on PCs. I loved the golf games on the Amiga and the Spectrum, although not the same, obviously graphics-wise or sound-wise, I still like. It's a it's a sit down and relaxing sort of game with a I don't know with a gin and tonic on a beach, and you can have a few rounds of golf. It's uh, an interesting one, but one that yeah certainly take with me. And your luxury. My luxury non-Spectrum related is a a five hundred and one full-sized arcade cabinet with every arcade game in it. <laughs> so it's non spectrum related, it is gaming related. Of course it's gonna be gaming related. What what do you expect? A jacuzzi or something? Yeah. So that's everything. You've got a Hobbit, Jetpack, Cyclone, Adventure One, Fred, Timegate, Penetrator and Leaderboard. Yep, that's my and, and a huge big arcade what a main machine with every single arcade game ever on it. But it'd have to be a proper full size cab with um a CRT monitor and some nice speakers attached. <laughs> So that's your Desert Island disc, something I've wanted to do for it. Just thank you, Paul. I've actually really enjoyed that. I think it'll make a really good section. <laughs> Marvellous. Th thank you for not warning me about those questions. Right then. What else did I never get round to doing? Ah, yes. I wanted to redo episode 40, as mentioned in Desert Island Discs, to include the few magazines that I'd left out. I covered one of them, Games Computing, in episode 58 as a sort of catch-up, but let's take a quick look at one of the other ones I missed. Complete Spectrum. This short run of magazines published by Database Publications began in January 1985 and ran for only six issues. It wasn't a magazine by the standards of others such as Sinclair User or Crash, it was more of an introductory reference guide in six parts. There was no news or games, but it did contain a great set of photographs, adverts unique to the magazine and good articles on programming. One of the double page photographs that I like, I've scanned and tried to join up the best I can to get a full image. I think it's worth it. On to issue one then, and this takes you through setting up your spectrum, saving and loading, printing, the keyboard, various add-ons to improve your micro, most with decent photographs too. And this is a great picture of a specy setup, all shiny and new. Interesting that they didn't go for the ZX printer though, although I think by this time it had been discontinued anyway. And on the next page for the more adventurous and those with deep pockets is a different setup, the ultimate setup, with the DK Tronics keyboard, Discovery Opus, VTX 5000, 
and a decent printer, although it doesn't mention the name. And this advert I haven't seen anywhere else. It reminds me of another advert for a different system, maybe a console. And there's even an interview with a stern-looking Clive Sinclair. On to issue two then. And this has various basic tutorials covering variables, ink and paper, drawing commands like circle and plot. And there's a good piece on disk drives and a mention for a little-known system, the Triton QD. Following this is an article about the ZX Microdrive, again with great pictures. We even get to see inside of them. And following on, we learn about the commands used to control them too. There's an article that covers the benefits of a monitor over conventional televisions, but I suspect not many people could afford one back then. There's a piece on animation covering different ways of making things move. Again, there are some good examples of this, along with programs to type out for yourself. And Silly Rubberman, as I call him, contemplates upgrading the RAM of your Spectrum. Issue 3 continues with basic, and there's variables, animation, graphics, and hexadecimal. And look at interfaces too, and printers, and how to upgrade your keyboard. There's Silly Rubberman again, illustrating a feature on databases. And this pullout with more adverts that offers exclusives to this magazine. This issue finished with a quick look at the 128K Toast Rack machine. And here's a nice illustration of a broken spectrum. On to issue 4, and the basic tutorials continue with four next loops, animations again, machine code graphics, and some examples of how to scroll the screen. There's a feature on the AMX mouse, which also covers the supplied program the Art Studio. The Spectrum 128 gets another feature about the working innards, and silly Rubberman here, again looking at joysticks. And he has the audacity to call the cheetah rat strange. There's a feature looking at art packages with a nice comparison chart, and it ends with spreadsheets and machine code registers. Issue 5, and we're still through the tutorials with data statements, with examples of how to read data into BASIC. There's a nice piece on communications and bulletin board systems. Some really memorable images here too. Ah, who remembers the Midnight Micronetters Club? Following on, there's a feature about modems that links up with the communications piece, but I don't think I could have built my own. A nice guide to terminology too. Ah, all those V numbers. Another piece about communication, this time covering Microlink. And still with communication, a piece about hacking, giving definitions, explaining what it is and why you shouldn't really be doing it for yourself. Moving away from communications, there's an article about how BASIC is interpreted by the computer, and another one on drawing graphics to screen. And yes, Mr. Silly Rubberman comes back with a graphics tablet. Hmm. The BASIC programming tutorials continue with articles about colour and structured programming. Moving to machine code next, and there's a series with calls, jumps and loops. I never had this magazine, but it looks really helpful for anyone wanting to learn machine code. The exclusive offers has some new additions in this one, with the Sinclair Pocket TV and the VTX 5000. There's a nice advert for the Opus Discovery, too. The magazine had very thick pages, so things like this look great. You can't see the print on the other side, so scanning or taking photographs produce good results. This advert always annoys me. Why are they holding the mouse the wrong way? Things draw to a conclusion with a piece looking at the 1 to 8 again. They don't seem that impressed with it, though. If only they could look into the future and see the prices on eBay. There's a piece about plotters. Never seen that device before, though, but it does need Interface 1. The Penman looks very interesting. I bet they sold about five of them, though. They don't mention the prices, and I couldn't find any mention of them anywhere else. And I even discovered at this point that World of Spectrum had removed my original Spectrum hardware index from its site. Well, that was nice of them. I spent years building that up, and some of it was out of date, I'll grant you, but it did provide a list of every known bit of hardware for the Spectrum. Oh well, I'll just have to rebuild that for my own website then. Work in progress. On to the final issue then, and this concludes the basic tutorials with examples of how arrays work and string comparisons. There's a piece about how to structure games too, and a section on machine code graphics. There is a piece on the Spectrum in schools, with a few nice photographs. The education slant continues with what the magazine explains as experts looking at educational programming. And for the last time, Mr. Silly Rubberman looks inside a spectrum, but the article itself is about how machine code interprets things in BASIC. There's a large section about adventure games with some nice illustrations. They explain what an adventure game is and how they work and how to play them, and review some of the more well-known titles like The Hobbit and Return to Eden. They cover writing your own adventures too, with utilities such as the quill, and there's even a type-in. Now interestingly, I couldn't find this type-in on any website. 
There is an adventure by the same name, Gravely Manor, but it has graphics and is obviously an upgraded version, I think. The tagline for both games is identical, Unravel the Secrets of Gravely Manor in Search of the Mysterious Amulet. Surely not a coincidence. And the rooms have the same descriptions. Hmm, maybe it was taken and converted to the quill or something and released later. The machine code section covers the instruction set and again gives examples. And that's it. The last page allows you to order the binders for the complete set along with the dust cover. I found this to be a very interesting magazine set. There were great machine code tutorials, good hardware coverage, and it didn't just concentrate on games. In fact, apart from how to write them, there was no mention of games at all other than adventures, obviously. Moving on then, whew, what shall we do next? I think it's time we had some fun. Remember that lovely picture from the Complete Spectrum magazine? Well, I had the stupid idea that it would be brilliant to recreate it in real life in my office. I already had a Spectrum, the Alphacom printer, Interface 1, Interface 2 and two microdrives. That just left the TV and tape recorder. Well, it took a bit of tracking down, but I managed to get hold of that tape recorder. It's a Sharp RD620E, and after a bit of cleaning, that was ready. But despite my best efforts, I couldn't get hold of the television. But let's have a go anyway. I'll use my old 14-inch portable CRT instead. I know it's the wrong colour, but hey, at least I'm making an effort. With a nice red background, I started placing the stuff as near as I could to the original, using the magazine as a guide, cleaning things as I added them, and trying to hide the cables the best I could. Eventually it was ready, and here it is. That great picture recreated. I had to merge some of the background in because the sheet wasn't wide enough. And to be honest, I'm not really happy with it. The reflection on the TV was bad, the image just wasn't sharp enough, probably due to the bad lighting conditions and the fact I used my phone. So I set it all up again, this time on the floor to give me more room. And here's the result. I'm still not 100% happy, but at least I did enjoy myself. It took a few months to prepare and get the right items, but it looks fabulous in real life. Well, that was a happy few hours that went very quickly getting it all set up and photographing it. So what else could I do? Well, going back to one of my wanted things to do, emulators. During a recent house move, I dug out my old Xbox, you know, the original one. I hadn't set this up for over three years, but I knew there was a Spectrum emulator on it, amongst other things. A few minutes later, and we were all ready to go. Ah, the familiar Xbox boot sequence. Followed by an unusual menu, this is Evolution. I soft modded my Xbox when this allowed me to load it up with various emulators and games. For more details of this and a run through of my many emulators and games on here, check out my Patreon video. But for now, let's concentrate on the Spectrum emulator. Was it any good? Once loaded up, we can jump into the settings, which are, compared to modern emulators, a bit sparse. You can set the model of Spectrum with four choices, the 48K, 128K, plus 2 and plus 3. This also has a knock-on effect of changing the on-screen keyboard as well, which is a nice feature. There are various loading options, instant tape loading being the most important one here, we don't want to wait forever for a game to load. And there are also various video settings, filters and scaling and so on you can select which joystick you want to be emulated via the D-pad. Now you just go into the file browser and pick a game, and the emulator supports formats like TAP and Z80. The game loads quickly and you're ready to go. I first tried Aquaplane to test out the timings, and sadly it's not accurate as you can see. The border split effect is wrong, although the game does play fine. If you haven't seen this game before, you just dodge various things in the water to reach the end of the level. Nice little game this, and ideal for the Xbox controller. Next is Attic Attack, and this worked perfectly. You know how to play this, so no point in explaining. The Xbox gamepad worked fine, although I don't know which key you use to collect things, which could be a little bit tricky. On to Exelon then, and another great game, and yes, it plays fine. Using the buttons for jump made it a bit tricky because of the layout. 
and the fact that you only had one hand to do that with the other one controlling the directions. Next, Manic Miner. Yes, had to put this in, didn't we? And it works fine. But then again, it's just left, right and jump. It was really odd playing Spectrum games using an Xbox controller, but enjoyable nonetheless. Now it was time to try out a multi-coloured game. Let's go for Sun Bucket. This uses the Nirvana engine, and no, it doesn't work. It seems the emulator doesn't support it, which, to be honest, is not surprising. The emulator was released in 2004, and the Nirvana engine was released in 2013. Let's try some 1 to 8K games then. Metal Man Reloaded. Yes, this works just fine. And a great game too. How about Boogie Boy then? Ah, that familiar music. And the game, yep, it works great as well. The whole thing was a blast from the past. This Xbox used to sit underneath my TV in the living room and be used many times a week, often nightly, and now sadly it just sits in a cupboard. I did want to set it up permanently in my new office next to my PS3, but I hadn't got enough cable length or space to do that. This may change though as I move around furniture and rearrange things. I really enjoyed playing Spectrum games on the Xbox, and of course Xbox games too. I also enjoyed going through the library of the other systems that are emulated like the Intellivision, Mega Drive and SNES. The Xbox was a brilliant console in its own right, with some really good titles for it. Here, for example, is Outrun 2. Yeah. It had enough power to emulate other systems, and brilliant coders exploited this, not only to open the system up, but to write emulators for it. It seems that the Spectrum is always high on the list of emulators to write for other systems. I think it's only topped by Doom, which seems to have been ported to almost everything. Well, sadly, that's the end of the show, and the end of this series. It was a mammoth effort to get all this out, and I hope you enjoyed it. Episode 100 was a superb milestone, and I'm very proud to have got there. Thank you, of course, to all those viewers and subscribers. My Patreon followers have allowed me to continue buying and repairing hardware, and yes, there will be another series. I may take a short break though, but I'll be back with another 10 episodes of Spectrum Nostalgia very soon. Thank you for watching. <laughs>